Hello and welcome to Gendering Geopolitics, my short series where I have quick 10 minute conversations with women who are doing amazing work around the world. My name is Emily Prey and I'm a senior analyst at the New Lines Institute in Washington, DC. Today, I'm speaking with Sarah Wahidi, the founder and CEO of the app Etasab and one of Time Magazine's next generation leaders about the situation in Afghanistan. Thank you so much for joining me today, Sarah. Thank you, Emily. So to jump right in, the Taliban have been targeting specific ethnic minority groups, notably the Hazara for crimes against humanity and for what many are saying could possibly be genocide. What should the U.S. and its allies be doing to, in response to this and why aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I think we're past the point of questioning whether this is a genocide. Uh, this is definitely a the previous um, Afghan government, uh, we were seeing systematic targeted attacks towards the Hazara and nothing was done. And the fact that it took the Taliban regime takeover for the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights to even be appointed is something that was obviously needed, but, you know, incredibly overdue. And now that that position has been established, we're still seeing a huge lag in the United Nations making the next move to ensure that the UN Special Rapporteur is doing what they need to be doing to keep the Taliban accountable. Um, and, and now we're seeing that also with, with ISK. Um, like I said, this is something that we have seen over the last two decades. This isn't new to anyone. Um, but the fact that it has become so incessant and the fact that we are seeing um, such rapid displacement going on, especially in areas like Daikundi, um, the, the UN Special Rapporteur needs to be much more explicit and clarify specifically what the United Nations is going to be doing to respond to the Hazara genocide that is currently going on. And what does that mean um, and, and how is that going to affect possible conversations about humanitarian aid. But the first step, which essentially is our only op option as Afghans, is for the United Nations to get involved. But to what extent um, are they going to be involved? And to what extent are they going to be holding the Taliban accountable? Because we are past questioning what's going on with the, the Hazara people. That's been established. Now it's tangible, explicit results and action points by the United Nations. A strong call to action, and I very much appreciate it. Um, looking at the situation of food insecurity in Afghanistan, it's rising to alarming levels. More than half of the population, which is about 22.8 million people, face acute food insecurity, while 3.2 million children under five could suffer from acute malnutrition if the situation continues on as it is. So Afghans are selling off not only their belongings, but also in some cases, cases their children to survive. How long do you think this stalemate will last of the Taliban clearly desperately needing foreign aid, but doing nothing to appease Western donors, such as reinstating girls' education? I mean, we have to consider the way that the Taliban came back into power. It was not through the people's vote. It was not through the majority and, and their uh, opinion. I mean, anyone, if you have a gun to your head and if it's being forced upon you, you are going to go with whatever way the forces are, are set in front of you. And we need to remember how the Taliban came into power and it was not through the people's vote. Considering that, I understand where the hesitation from international agencies and organizations come from in how to disperse the funding, um, especially, you know, utilizing previous technocrats that worked during the Ghani uh, administration, it just doesn't seem plausible to perhaps have some sort of, um, you know, uh, a process in which uh, members of the former administration are facilitating that process because we very much understand that the Taliban is not equipped to manage benchmarks um, and humanitarian aid that will be set 
uh, from the United Nations and international um, agencies. But essentially, it, it can't be also just a blank check uh, for the Taliban to say that you are not allowing girls uh, to return to school. We are seeing incessant displacement of the Hazara people across the country. We are still seeing human rights violations, violations against the ability for journalists to do their work transparently. So again, it's all about the fact that we're seeing the international community be essentially mum about the Taliban and just deciding to go you know, with the flow. And it, it, it's, it's alarming because we are allowing the Taliban to do as they like, do as they please. At, at the same time, they have these uh, requests for aid, but there needs to be an, 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 an explicit request from the Taliban, not only from what, what the United, from what the international community is expecting from them, but also what the international community is going to be doing to keep the Taliban accountable. It just seems like the world has stepped away from Afghanistan and is just letting its due course turn out. But that's just not the way that we can allow this to happen because 70% of the population is under the age of 25. We are going to be, we are seeing a humanitarian crisis at hand and it requires the international community to get hands on with Afghanistan again. If it's not about diplomacy or state building, it needs to be about responding to an alarming humanitarian crisis that is unfolding, which will have impacts that expand that extend much farther than Afghanistan's borders. Absolutely. And certainly those impacts will, it, it won't just be months and years, but it will be decades and generations. And it really is up to the U.S. and its allies and those who have a serious responsibility to, responsibility to Afghanistan to step up and do their job. Um, and spe speaking of the U.S.'s responsibility, if you had 10 minutes with President Biden, what would you say to him? I would start with the fact that I guess if my, my fundamental beliefs, I've always be believed that I, I guess I lean towards democratic values. But what we see from the Biden administration was is not the democratic values that I learned about or that I read about or that I, I personally am passionate about. To leave Afghanistan in the way that the Biden administration decided to and decided to uphold the Trump administration and their uh, a stance on uh, the withdrawal. Also not taking a moment to see the, the gross uh, failures of, of Khalilzad um, and those who worked in Afghanistan at the time and the way that they engaged with the Taliban is just, it is just farcical to me. And I would very much like to know truly what the imperative was here for such a hasty withdrawal that has affected not only the trust of Afghans and other countries who will have these types of interactions with the U.S. government or the United States, where the U.S. is going to come in and say that we are going to state build or we are going to rid you of terrorism. Um, that's just no one's going to be believing that anymore. And I would want to know from President Biden explicitly what the reasoning for that was, especially with the humanitarian crisis that we're seeing right now, the instability that we're seeing, the, the method in which, you know, we, we saw this huge brain drain of Avons dispersed across the world, just to understand whether he understands the ramifications that have occurred um, to keeping to that script and to keeping to that timeline and whether it was truly worth it um, with all of the humanitarian crises we're seeing with the death of journalists, with the death of activists, um, it's, it, it wasn't really worth it. So can you speak a little bit about the strength and resilience of the Afghan youth like yourself, not just both in the country and also in the diaspora and what your hopes are for Afghanistan? Well, um, I was born and have left Afghanistan and returned after my studies and I have left again and my mother and my father, they've all gone through this, my grandparents. We are a country born out of a migration wave and this is how we've identified ourselves essentially. We are identified as a very resilient um, uh, uh, you know, group of, of people, a very resilient nation, but that's 
not necessarily something to be proud of. There's nothing to be proud of, of having to, in a modus, take this into your home. And for those who are very much privileged to do so, um, I mean, we still have, you know, out of 36 million, probably we still have 35.8 million still in the country. We've only seen a blip of the country be able to, um, um, you know, extract themselves from the Taliban regime and the Taliban takeover. And I, I know that there are a lot of Afghans around the world right now who are just dealing with that pain and that guilt, uh, a survivor's guilt that they have. So and, and on one hand, I've always urged the Afghan diaspora to take whatever fantastic talents they have and, you know, give it back to the country, whether it's through education, whether it's through technology, um, whether it's through, through, through healthcare, whatever your niche is, you have the ability to give back, especially with, um, you know, the, 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 the vast opportunities of technology. Uh, it, is challenge, it is challenging, but there are opportunities to bring about change and to connect with Afghans and not to forget who is still there. It is, it is everyone. You know, we, we can't even say a majority. Everyone is still there. Everyone who had the ability, the, the incredible privilege to get out, that's not a small thing. Um, you know, we're, we still have a, a full nation that is now under the Taliban regime. And what does that mean uh, for, for Afghan youth and the next generation? And it really is to stand on the values that you uphold um, and also make sure that you're able to um, advocate for those who, who are still in Afghanistan, but also not to take away their platform. Whenever the safety and the ability is there for them to speak on their own behalf, allow that and, and vocalize that and, and, and you know, let those who are there, that those who are suffering and who are experiencing uh, what life is under a Taliban uh, regime to speak, to, to ask what they need. Um, and to, um, you know, make sure that those voice, voices are uh, uh, vocalized as best as we can. So we need a very, we need a very strong collaboration between Afghan diaspora and those Afghans who, who still are in Afghanistan. Absolutely. No one is voiceless. Everybody has a voice. They just need the opportunity and the safety to speak. Um, and I also just want to highlight your important work giving back to Afghanistan with your app. Um, so everybody, please do check that out. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for your time. Thank you for coming on Gendering Geopolitics. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Emily.